And next on the agenda, we're going to have Greg Harder speaking about technical advances in polymers. Well, good morning. Um, it's funny that he mentioned the title of my talk. I asked him what would I be talking about, and he said, well, the use of polymer in pavement preservation. So I thought, well, that's a pretty easy subject. No problem. I'll do that. Quite frankly, I am not the guy to talk about the chemistry of polymers. Secondly, I reached out to my friends in the polymer industry, uh, folks at Craton, um, Momentum Technologies, and others, and said, hey, man, I need some help. Can you bail me out? So they sent me a few slides of which I'm going to use, um, really not related to the subject, so that's why I have not. Um, after I searched to see what it was they were actually looking for me to talk about, two different people told me, just talk about whatever you want to. So I'm warning you in advance, that's what I'm doing. Just a little bit about emulsions. Um, when we talk about emulsions, and, and you know, there's a, we, we focus on obviously asphalt emulsions, but emulsions are, are, there's a lot of emulsions that we use. Hi, Scott, didn't mean to pick on you, but. Um, you know, uh, uh, ice cream is an emulsion, mayonnaise is an emulsion, and, and really what we look at in asphalt emulsions, um, the asphalt is one component. Obviously, we, we have a, a soap or a surfactant, um, we have water, and then we have some type of mechanical action where we shear those asphalt particles uh, to make, make an emulsion. Emulsion is basically taking two materials that otherwise don't want to be blended together and using these components and using mechanical action, making them uh, a stable and a homogeneous uh, product. There's other materials that we can add to those. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the polymers that, uh, that are being utilized. Um, I, I teach a lot of classes, and when I talk about emulsions, the way I best describe an emulsion is, again, we're taking oil and trying to blend it with water. And we know that they won't stay uh, uniformly blended, but through the use of a surfactant and through the high shear uh, mill, if you think of each one of us in this room um, as a droplet of asphalt, okay, and the room is filled with water, Okay, and now we're all coated with a, with, a, with a surfactant that has a certain charge to it, whether it's a cationic or an anionic or even a, a non-ionic, but it's given a charge to each one of us. And if you look at the laws of electricity, right, like charges repel, okay, opposites attract. So since we're all in this room full of water and we're all charged alike, what do you think we're trying to do? We're trying to get as far away from one another as we can. So that's how these two materials become uh, a homogeneous material. Stacy's here, she can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this stuff, but um, it, it, that's, that's how we, we become stable in an emulsion. Once, once we introduce those emulsions to aggregates, we have pH changes that take place, we have evaporation of the water and what's left. After all the water's gone, we're back to that original asphalt. So a um, little bit on, on emulsions. Um, most commonly today, or, or at least originally what we saw, I shouldn't say most commonly today, but the use of uh, uh, styrene butadiene rubber, uh, SBR, um, or latex as it's commonly called, uh, were traditionally used when we manufactured asphalt emulsions. Um, you can utilize the, the latex in a number of different fashions. You can put it in with your soap as you're batching your soap. Uh, you can inject it into the asphalt line on the way to the mill. It can go into the soap line. But it's relatively easy and relatively versatile um, in terms of manufacturing. And I think that's one of the big, the big plus, one of the big pluses to using latex. Um, also, um, since we don't have to have it in the asphalt phase itself, the temperatures are a little lower, and we can produce these materials at lower temperatures without the concern of boiling the emulsion. Um, the polymer with latex, and this is a, a big difference between what I'm going to talk about in a little bit, with latex, the polymer is in the water phase. Okay, it's not within the asphalt phase. Um, when we look at chip seals, very commonly used um, uh, for chip seals, and if you look at the order of migration and what takes place, we spray the emulsion on the ground, we put the chips on top of it, and the water tends to be the first thing that wicks up on the aggregate, and what goes along with that, well, what's in the water phase is the, is the latex itself, and then finally the asphalt droplets. So we get a very strong um, polymer network at the aggregate surface when we use uh, uh, latex-modified emulsions. Um, I guess I kind of got ahead of myself, but you can see that action where that's pulling up and we create that, that network right at the, the uh, interface of the aggregate. Um, if you look at uh, chip loss, and this is just done on a, on a sweep test, um, this is Paragon had provided this information. Oh, I should mention, you'll notice the AMAP logo. I reached out to my friends at uh, Craton and this is what they provided. So uh, comp uh, I, I want to make sure that they get credit for these slides. Um, and you can look at the different uh, aggregate types. Um, the dark blue samples show the, uh, the uh, stone retention 
um, for the unmodified emulsion and then the latex modified emulsion. So you can see in all cases, and especially specific to the aggregates themselves, you can have a significant improvement in stone retention uh, through the use of, of latex modified emulsions um, uh, for chip seals. And again, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Microsurfacing, another common application for latex. Um, again, we're, we are uh, um, going through the operation, very short mix time, putting material down on the road, and we want to open up to traffic. So we really want to try to build uh, quick cohesion within these mixes. Um, also, we look at the abrasion, um, uh, and, and uh, through the use of latex-modified emulsions, you'll see not only the one-hour but the six-hour uh, we have uh, much less loss through the, the through the use of latex emulsion. So um, again, preaching to the choir, I think Ben's going to talk maybe a little bit about some of the state experience and why they use uh, polymers. But um, you know, in summary, early and long uh, uh, chip retention for for polymerized uh, emulsions and chip seals, and then improved cohesion and reduction in abrasion loss of aggregate um, for uh, microsurfacing. However, what what we're seeing more of an increase in. Um, is, is the use of polymer modified asphalts and then emulsifying them. So unlike latex that's in the water phase, now we're actually going to put the polymer inside the asphalt phase first and then emulsify that. Um, what that does is it does change the characteristics of that residual binder, um, but along with this, because we're adding polymers to the asphalt, generally our emulsion temperatures are much higher. Uh, the reason for that is um, during manufacturing, because of the increase in viscosity in asphalt, you have to raise the temperature. Because you raise the temperature of the asphalt, the final product goes up. Uh, one of the concerns and one of the, the things that is kind of um, uh, in the past had slowed the use of these products was the fact that you had to have some type of a um, um, heat exchanger or put some back pressure on the mill to make sure that the emulsion doesn't boil. Remember, the boiling point of water is 212. So if we have very, very hot asphalt and we're putting it in two-thirds and then one-third is going to be this, this soap solution, we don't want to boil the emulsion. So um, from a processing standpoint, you know, had historically had been a little more difficult to do. Um, however, some of the things, and this is my one slide on polymer advances, so take it all in right now. Um, after this, if you want to leave, feel free to. Um, one of the things that's starting to come out is these, these compound polymers. Uh, generally speaking, we've used styrene butadiene or styrene butadiene styrene. Uh, some of these newer polymers will have some other components in there, um, which do two things. Number one, it will reduce the viscosity of the asphalt blend, and it allows for higher concentrations of, of polymers. Um, if we can do that, and, and it's been successfully done, therefore we can lower the binder temperature and have less of a concern with boiling the emulsion. Um, so we're starting to see some more of this. Um, there's some applications where, you know, some may be more desired than others, and this is maybe just my opinion, but um, in applications like chip seals, um, you know, that type of an application, sticky is good, right? Because we're not really, we want to grab that stone and hold onto it as quickly as we can. Um, the latex modified emulsions tend to be a little stickier. However, for other applications, sticky maybe isn't as good. And, and when you look at cold in place recycling, um, central plant recycling, any kind of cold mix paving, um, we, from a handling uh, characteristic, it becomes very, very difficult. Anybody that's ever been on a cold in place job and then put too much latex in, I mean, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. So um, I think that's where we're starting to see some more interest in the use of polymers. So um, anyway, that's my last slide on polymer advances. Now I'm going to talk about the things I want to talk about. Ray did some work for the university or for uh, Wisconsin DOT. And what he did is he looked at the different uh, mix parameters um, and how they affected the crack resistance and related it back to um, a cracking test. And so what he found was it was very, very sensitive to the volume of effective asphalt in the mix. Um, it was very sensitive to um, the amount of binder replacement as well as not only the low temperature PG grade that's being used but the amount of polymer. And I love this table. This is for all the DOTs here. Take a good look at this because I think this is really a brilliant approach. Um, his standard mix for Wisconsin, let's say, was a 12.5-millimeter uh, mix, had a volume of effective asphalt of 10% um, with no wrap of 58S28. However, let's say you wanted to put in, I don't know, the binder replacement ratio. Let's go down to, say, 10 to 15% binder replacement ratio. Well, guess what? If you do that, you've got to increase the volume of virgin binder. 
that volume of effective binder now has to go to 11.1. .1. So going from here down to 15% wrap, you've got to put a little bit more virgin binder in there if you use the same binder. But you know what? If you went to a polymer modified binder with that low temperature grade, you can keep the same amount. If you want to go much higher in wrap, maybe you've got to go to a lower low temperature grade. Um, and all he did is develop some regression equations and, and took all this thing back. And this was based on not just one aggregate. These were mixes from across the state, different aggregates. Um, and, and it's really conceptually something that I think we've always known. I mean, what I really like, and it's probably not the most popular thing to say, but even at 5%, we have an impact on our cracking resistance in our pavements. So um, again, this might be the reason I don't get invited back. but. Um, but anyway, it's, it's really a brilliant approach. Um, I look back, and, and, and one of the things that Ray showed in that was the use of polymers and their effect. And again, to, to some of the folks in this room, Chris Euler for one, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, we did a study a number of years ago looking at quantifying the, the effect of polymers in our mixes. And what was really unique is when we surveyed all these states and looked at what you see here is a graph. On the bottom are the PMA sections. On the top, uh, on the y-axis, are companion sections. So same mixes, just one has polymer, one doesn't. Um, and compared to performance, this is looking at rutting. But when we interviewed all these states, most everyone said they used polymer to prevent rutting. What was really unique is very few of them said they were using it to prevent cracking. And what, so anyway, here's the rutting. Uh, the line you see is a line of normalcy. Anything above that shows that we had more rutting in the non-polymer section than we did in the polymer. Not a big surprise that almost all the points are above that. If we look at fatigue cracking, again, and I don't think not a single state was using polymer to prevent fatigue cracking. Look at here the lion's share of the points that are above that curve, which is saying that there's more fatigue cracking in the control section than there is in the polymer sections. Um, the same is true for transverse cracking. Again, we have a few outliers there, but for the lion's share, there's a lot more cracking and less in the polymer section. So, um, you know, just again, I think, uh, I think that's important, um, the use of polymer. I've been on a circuit here. We had a co-op with Federal Highway Administration. In the last two years, we did 28 of these high-density workshops, um, eight-hour workshop, and really focused um, with the states on the importance of getting density and their effect on, on durability of our pavements. Um, you've probably seen this study at one point or another, but Washington State uh, looked at their service life of their pavements, used a baseline of 7% air voids or 93% of density. Um, and as you fall off from that, as your density goes down, you see a dramatic decrease in the, the percentage of service life. When you get out to around 11% air voids, and unfortunately none of these states here are producing mixes that, that are placing them at 11, but you're losing about a third of your service life just because you have a lower density. We did some study, uh, study a laboratory study looking at flexural beam fatigue uh, for the state of Kentucky, and oddly enough, going from 11% air voids up to that same 7% showed about a one-third uh, reduction or, or I guess an increase in service life. So kind of matched up very well with what they found in the field in Washington. Um, NCAT did a study and they looked for a, uh, in, in their report said uh, a 1% decrease in air voids or a 1% increase in density, depending on the, the work that they looked at, um, ranged from 8.2 to 43% improvement um, in rutting so as we got better density, we saw an improvement in rutting. Um, and from uh, um, 7.3 to 66% improvement in the overall service life. 10% um, uh, is what we've been touting. For every 1% increase in density, we can, we can experience about a 10% increase in service life. Um, and that's really what they found. Oddly enough, Tom Bennett did some work with New Jersey DOT. Um, and what you see here is the average in place air voids and then on the y-axis is the time after construction till the first maintenance application. Okay, so you see some scatter there and, and, and I know the R squared is not very good, but part of that is, you know, what, uh, what Ben might think is a time that we, he has to do something on his road might be different from Ray. You know, Ray might be more forgiving with cracking before he goes out. So you see some scatter, but what's really unique about this is when you put a best fit line in there, look at the slope there of that curve of that line, it's 10%. So again, it really relates back to everything that we've seen in other studies that about a 1% increase in density results in a 10% increase in service life. Um, Nelson Gibson, while he was still with FHWA, uh, looked at a number of different cracking tests, a number of different rutting tests, and very different parameters, looked at a, a few different mixes. And the only two I wanna point out here is 
Um, design VMA, just think of it what Ray was looking at in terms of um, changing the volume of effective binder, but for every 1% increase in effective binder, which relates to about 0.3 to 0.4% by weight of mix. Um, a 73% decrease in, in cracking, however, when you add binder, you do have the potential, if you don't change anything else, with an increase in rutting. However, they also looked at changing the density. And so when they increased the density, not only did they improve the crack resistance, but they also improved the rut resistance. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I'm going to get back to all this and tie it all together. This was just something that in our workshop, and I don't know how, how well you can relate to this, but um, this, was, this got more conversation in the eight-hour workshops. And I just threw this in um, just because I, I talked to a guy named Bill Pine, and we had discussed this. But what you see here is the top curve. I just took a production mix, 9.5 millimeter mix out of New York, uh, my former employer suit coat. And um, the point on the far right, this point and this point, Okay, what you see here is percent compaction, and this is just air voids. Just, this is just 100 minus that, okay? So whichever you're more comfortable in looking at. Um, when you do a QC sample in the plant, your sample height is about 115 millimeters in height. So let's just say for argument's sake, uh, I think they put in like 4,800 grams into the mold. They compacted at 75 gyrations. And this is what they got. They got um, down here about 3.8% air voids, so whatever this is, 96.2 up here. So well, then what we did, we took the same mix, just you know, the same from the same bucket, and said, let's put 80% of that mix in, the, in there and compact it, 75 gyrations. Let's put 60% in there. Let's put 50. Let's put 40, 30, 20. And that's all you see here is just a percentage. What we were trying to demonstrate was the effect that lift thickness has on our ability to get density. In these cases, we're putting the same compactive effort in there. So if lift thickness didn't matter, if I put half the material in the mold, what should happen? My sample should be half as tall, but the same exact density. And instead of showing the actual compacted lift thickness, what we always talk about is the compacted lift thickness times the nominal maximum aggregate size. What do most of the states use? Four times the nominal aggregate size. So if I have a mix that has, is a 12.5 millimeter mix, okay, it's a half inch mix, what do I put it down at? Two inches. So. And, I, and I, I was taught this when I got in this industry, and I've, we've been out there and promoting it for years. What, what it's always been is three to five times the nominal aggregate size. Anybody ever hear that? Any DOT guys? That's where you should be at, three to five. Well, take a look at this. And this is the conversation I had with Bill Pine about this. There's our three to five, and that's what we've been recommending for years. Okay? It's really interesting there. Look at the damn slope of that. Look at the slope between going from three to five times the nominal aggregate size. Half a millimeter reduction in thickness, and again, this is in the gyratory, resulted in a 1.43% decrease in density. Now, I know, I know it's different in the Northeast, that when you guys pave, if you put two inches, it is uniformly two inches everywhere. There's never high spots, right? There's never low spots. It is always exactly, right, Ed? At least in Massachusetts it is. So, so, so if I'm a contractor looking at this, I go out and do everything I can to get uniform density, and I'm on a PWL spec, all I gotta have is a high spot in there and I could get penalized. Not that I did anything wrong, not that the mix is any different, but purely based on the, the geometry of, of what we're doing. Um, looking at it a different way, that same data, going from five to four times the nominal aggregate size, reduced the density about a percent and a half. Going from four to three, reduced it 4.1. Now I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus, but I heard somebody here talk about inch and a quarter overlays. I hope to God they're very small nominal aggregate size mixes, okay? Um, it's not that we can't get density at those, but look at how much more effort it takes, okay? And if we go down the road of trying to improve density, you know, what is it we need to consider, okay? Um, there were states that we did this workshop that had specs that they allowed 10% in place air voids and got 100% payment, okay? Up here, we would say that's, out of, that's unacceptable. We would be removed and replaced for many states up here. But the reality is when you have a pretty robust spec to go into a room full of contractors and say, hey, we want you to raise the bar and raise the density, how are you gonna achieve it? Well, this is one thing that needs to be reconsidered. Um, ideally, just put thicker lifts down, all right? If there were any contractors in the room and the DOTs left here and they all said, you know what? We're gonna start thickening up our roads. They'd put me on their shoulders, the contractors, they'd carry me out, chanting my name. I'd be a hero, right? But we know that's not the reality. So one of the things that you need to consider is start to consider using smaller nominal maximum aggregate size mixes. 
New York does a lot of 6.3 millimeter mix. What do you place it at? Three quarters, one inch. Okay, three quarters, that's, that's three times. One inch is four times. You ever think about putting it at an inch and a half? I'm not picking on you, but, but um, you know, where you have money for an inch and a half, consider using a smaller nominal mag maximum aggregate size. So anyway, there's other benefits too, and I can't squeeze eight hours into 12 minutes here. So, um, so anyway, durability. You know, there's, we know how to get more durable roads. I mean, it, it's out there, right? Increase the density. We know that. Every study that we looked at showed that. Um, add more binder. Ray's show, work showed that. Uh, you can pick up just about any test, and when they start to change the amount of effective binder in the mixes, they become more uh, crack resistant. Guess what? When we add more binder, we also know that potentially it's easier to get density. Oh, it's easier to get density, but if you follow your old your standard specs for density, the contractor loves it because he can take passes off, but he's not going to do any better in the field because he doesn't want to get penalized. So you've got to reconsider your density specs as well. Um, thicker lifts. Okay, or it using smaller nominal maximum aggregate size. Use more polymer, okay, and um, we, we've seen that. Um, and the other thing is minimize, minimize use of wrap, or if you're gonna use wrap, make sure you adjust for it, either with softer binder grades or increased quantity of binder. And if we do all this, if we do all this, maybe this room full of people will actually have projects that you're putting pavement preservation down when it should be put down, not when it's cracked so far that then we have questions as to why our microsurfacing didn't work. I surveyed all the contractors, or a bunch of contractors and hot mix producers in the state of New York, and I asked them, I said, if you could do anything you want, you know, this is confidential, believe me, they had to make that clear. It's, but I said, if you could do anything you wanted, what would you do differently than you're doing today to make your murder road? Um, I, I phrased it two ways. If money was no object, or it was a 20-year warrant, warranty that you were doing, your boss came to you, what would you do differently? And you'd be surprised some of the, the answers when they knew that their name wasn't going to be attached to it. But one of the things that alarmed me was they said, no more thin lays. No more thin lays. And I said, why is that? And they said, the thin lay is not the problem. The problem is the candidate projects we're putting it on, it's not meeting the DOT's expectations and it's a blemish for our industry. We either need to get the thin lays on sooner or do some type of a structural repair. So this is my, my thought is if we can start to extend the service life, maybe you guys get actually better candidates for, for some of these pavement preservation techniques. So in that vein, right time, um, d doing the right thing. This was some work we did with Minnesota, um, and this is Truck Highway 56, okay? Um, basically, this project was paved in 1999, and then um, in 2000, 2001, 2002, they started to put uh, sections of it. They did a, a seal coat or a chip seal on um, what we did is we went in in 2011, took cores from all of these sections, cut off this, the chip seal layer, and then looked at the top one inch of mix and then the second uh, one inch of mix, and then measured it for uh, DCT. So this is what we found, okay? Um, again, this, this pavement was placed in 1999. These cores were taken in 2011. Um, so the section that was put a chip seal in on one year later you can see what the, the, the two layers were in terms of fracture energy. The higher the number, the better. See these lines right here? This is the top inch and the um, um, lower inch of, of, the, uh, of the mix that, had, that was a control section, okay? So those were those values. Basically what this is showing is, as long as you do a chip seal in year one or year two, you're gonna show some benefit not only to the top one inch, but even farther down. You know, people used to believe that if I put a chip seal on it, it doesn't have an inf effect on any of the mix lower down. Well, this, this work has actually showed that it does. Um, so again, getting to the timing, you know, when you're starting, if you place it 99 and you're out here in 2005, by then you're already back down here. The damage is already done. And so the idea here is that can you get the chip seal on a little bit sooner? Uh, that's all. Okay, another thing. I hate to travel. I hate flying anymore, okay? Um, and, I, and I say this every time I get on a damn airplane. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. And I haven't flown on all these lately, so maybe some of these things have changed. But the airlines have got it wrong. They got all this bad press now dragging people off and knocking their teeth out and whatever else they're doing. But um, here's the gripe I have with them. I travel with them. I carry my computer bag, okay, and I check my bag. I pay $25 to check my bag. It goes under the plane. It's not bothering anybody. 
some reason, I always get boarding group four, five, six, seven, or eight. I never get in the early boarding group. I get on the damn plane, the overhead compartment is filled because everybody and his brother has their carry-on bag because they don't want to spend $25. So I sit for the next four hours with my computer at my feet uncomfortable. And I tell the flight attendants, I tell pilots, anybody that listen to me, they're missing the boat. They need to charge for carry-on bags and don't charge for the check bags. The other thing is, I'm always in row 18 or beyond, it seems like. It takes like an hour to get off the plane because everybody in front of me can't get Get their damn overhead bag out. So just think of how fast we could get on and off planes and how comfortable we would all be if they just started charging for the damn carry-on. Sorry. Um, I, I will just add one more thing to that. We have a talk show. Southwest doesn't charge. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I just wish they would make it a penalty to carry on a bag. Um, just one other thing on that. I've never, ever called into a talk radio show, and there was a talk. We have one in Syracuse, the Bob Lonsberry Show, and the discussion was, and I forgot even what it was. All I heard was it was somebody was griping at the airlines for charging something. Man, I couldn't dial that number fast enough, and I was actually on the radio, and uh, my brother-in-law was listening, and he called my wife later, and he goes, your husband was on, he was on radio, wasn't he? So anyway, um, this is just something else, and this came up from some work, um, Judith, right? Something that you mentioned. I just added this after you talked the other day. And, and who is the girl from, um, I, I, wrote, I had her name out. Anyway, the girl from Washington. Um, this was something I did back in 2012. Um, this was actually one of our members. Uh, we, did, we used to have a thing called the Favorite Road Initiative. And it was a website we had. And you could get on. And, and it was not only you could post uh, information or pictures of your favorite road. Everybody's got a favorite road. But it also was a, a venue for us to give more information to the public about asphalt pavements. So anyway, big car show, biggest one in the, in the north, in the east coast, called the Syracuse Nationals every year in Syracuse. I don't know, like 10,000. Uh, 80,000 people come, like 10,000 vehicles are entered. Well, anyway, one of our members, Paul Suits, had his beautiful 68 Mustang, just got it uh, 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 completely redone. So we decided to have the booth there. He loaned, me the, loaned us the car, very nice of him to do that. And then we could, you know, get with people coming through. So anyway, what I decided to do was I, I put a survey together, and I'm going to go through it really fast with you guys on my computer. And um, what I, anybody I could get to come to the booth, I gave them a free T-shirt if they actually took the survey, okay? And it was a pretty cool shirt. It said, nice asphalt on it, you know? And, <laughs> and uh, so, so it was really, but, but I just, I only want to, I want to quantify this because this wasn't like a Gallup, a Gallup poll. It wasn't like I got equal men, equal women, you know, blacks, Hispanics, you know, whatever. It was anybody I made eye contact with that was stupid enough to come over. So... <laughs> So they got a free t-shirt, but what I want to say is that after they went through this, and you'll see what I did in the survey, very quick survey, not one person that got done with the survey took the t-shirt and ran, which was really impressive. They all stayed and talked to me about their roads and things that were going on, but there's one important point. There was just something you said I wanted to throw in here. So this was the first question, right? What type of roadway surface do you prefer to drive on? And what they would do is they would click on their answer, and it would come to this screen. And this would continually update. So as you can see, 77% of the people that took the survey said they prefer asphalt. 23% um, you know, said concrete. And then this would be the fact that they would see. So did you know 94%? OK. So the next question, what type of roadway surface is quieter to drive on? Okay, I thought this was a no-brainer. But there were still a few people there that said concrete was quieter. OK, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the point of with all the asphalt signs hanging there, they didn't get it, okay? But um, I don't know. So anyway, the next question I thought was pretty interesting is, you know, granted, this was in 2012, so with the numbers and the things you're going to see are based on um, reports, federal reports, uh, different, different sources from 2011. Um, what was the uh, most recycled material each year in this country? And um, I think they finally got the asphalt sign and then realized that. But what was amazing is um, steel was st second, and yet 3%, only one person thought steel was the number, uh, number you know, or even close to being up at the top. So um, plastic was pretty interesting that most people thought plastic was the, the number one uh, recycled material. So again, getting the message across, asphalt's number one. Um, this one was interesting. What percent of our roads are in poor condition? You know, is it less than 15%, 22, 32, or greater than 40? Um, and lo and behold, um, more than half the people said poor. Um, 
And, and this, was, this was something that I, I really stressed, and people spent a lot of time reading. And again, the numbers are probably a little different right now, but you know, 32% of our roads are in poor condition. And at this time, we're, in, we're considered in poor condition. Um, $67 billion a year in vehicle repairs, which equates to about $324 per year per motorist. Um, this was the other one that, that to me was pretty alarming. One in four bridges were structurally deficient. So when I would talk to people and when they left, I said, you got to cross any bridges on your way home? I said, on, on, the, on every fourth one, lift your feet, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyway, so, so I, I, I think it did a really good job of, of getting the message across. So um, this is the one, Judith, that, that made me think of putting this in here today was the federal gas tax. Okay, and as we all know, because Judith uh, told us the other day, it was 1993. But did you all know when he when Clinton raised it of by 4.3 cents a gallon? The first four years, it didn't even go into the highway trust fund. It went to pay down the deficit. So not only did the public think they were helping the roads for four years, it didn't go anywhere near the roads. Um, the interesting thing is, and again, this was a study back in 2011. For every penny increase in the gas tax, would generate about 1.8 billion dollars in revenue. What is that $1.8 billion on highway construction? 28,000 jobs, 9,500 in construction, 4,300 in other industries supporting that, 14,000 um, um, or non-construction sectors. Um, back in 1993, when they raised it by 4.3 cents a gallon, gas was, average price was $1.11. Anybody paying $1.11 right now for gas? No. So I threw this in there too. Average driver drives 12 to 15,000 miles a year, assume 25 miles per gallon. 15,000, that's 600 gallons annually, a penny a gallon, $6 a year. But we have no problem spending over 300 in repairs. Um, I guess the point of all this, oh, I'll, I'll get to this one next. I mentioned that afterwards no one left and they stood around and talked to me. And I didn't put it in the survey, but I asked them all, um, would you support a federal increase in the gas tax? And what was odd about this, and this, this I, I'm, I'm, I, I can say with 100% assurance, the answer was unanimous. What do you think the answer was when I said, would you support a gas tax? Huh? The answer was no. But here's what also came along with that. It had nothing to do with paying the gas tax. There was something equated to this afterwards. We don't trust the government. They'll spend it on something else. It will be used for something else. Nobody was not supportive of raising the gas tax and improving our roads. They just couldn't, because actually, and I didn't say that right. In, in, when I asked them about would you support it, I said, could, if I could guarantee that the money would be spent on roads and bridges, would you support it? And that's where it, they said, no, you can't guarantee it. So that's a pretty sorry state of affairs, you know. Um, and, and that's not, by all means, that don't anybody in an agency take that pointed at them. That's our legislators that should be giving you guys the money, and they're using it for all these other uh, projects. Um, this was interesting. Anybody guess what this one was? Huh? Come on, I mentioned the asphalt sign. Christ, I had a Ford Mustang in front of the booth. <laughs> if you're a Chevy guy, you're not walking over to it, so of course it was Chef Ford. Um, just a little bit on pavement preservation um, and the Asphalt Institute strongly support the concept of pavement preservation. Right, right treatment, right time, very, very important. Many of our AM members, many of them here, uh, also are involved in pavement preservation, make miles fight all, uh, emulsions as well. Um, some of the resources, and I threw these in because you can leave with these, and I'll, I'll actually send you some stuff in, in, in a few weeks. Um, we do seminars, uh, workshops focus on asphalt payment best practices, do a lot of education lab training. We have a number of publications. Uh, one I wanted to focus on today is the, some of our recorded webinars related to payment pres uh, uh, preservation and then the, the databases. In terms of the seminars, we've reached out in the last, uh, especially through our co-op with Federal Highway Administration, we don't even have in here, uh, I don't show the, the high density stuff, but we've reached out to an awful lot of, of uh, uh, industry and agency folks uh, in the last, in, in previous years. Um, in terms of uh, some of the educational offerings, we have a basic emulsion technician training program now at the Institute, and I can tell you what's under development. Just like our national binder technician certification, we're developing a national emulsion technician certification program. Uh, and I know the NETTCP has something up here, uh, but I'm not sure they have it for emulsions, do they? 
Okay. So anyway, maybe, and, and by the way, the binder technician, we've worked with NETCCP on as well. Um, some of the publications got a number of different things out there. Uh, these are the ones that are more focused on, on pavement preservation uh, and, and emulsions. Um, number of uh, recorded uh, webinars that we have out there. We have a five-part emulsified asphalt series. Um, these are listed. Um, these are all free. We've, we've Publish these so if you go on and I'll send you the instructions on you can probably work through it But it's a little clunky because Webex changed some of their things, um, but I'm gonna get some more detail I'll email them to you. you're welcome to go on with as many people and view them um, And and so we've got a five part. We have a three part on pavement preservation um, And those are free as well the related webinars. Eh, they're not free yet, but maybe uh, maybe we'll get to that point point. Um, and then finally um, thin lay over uh, thin lift overlays and tack code best practices um, uh, are also somewhat related pavement preservation here and uh, uh, those are free as well. Um, other than the state of New York, unfortunately that's where I'm from, you can receive a PDH certificate if you sit through these and, and we send those to you as well. Um, and then um, watching a webinar again, um, pretty easy to get to uh, our website, click on webinars. And again, once we have some more detailed information, I'll send out the actual directions on how to get go through the, the steps to each one. I've got your email from Patty. Um, and then we also have a, a specification database, uh, both for emulsions, uh, the massacre, as well as PG binders. Um, if you click on our website, um, go to emulsified uh, asphalts, click on the state, and then you can see what other states are doing. I only, the only thing I recommend is um, start looking outside of our region first, because I have to update this region, I'm a little behind on that. So give me a couple months and then it'll be more current. So uh, thanks to all our members. And I know I went way over on time. I'm sorry, Ben. Any uh, any qu questions? I'll be around anyway, but. I just wondered, uh, I was speaking by the, the, the uh, gyratory compactor densities and the, the, the less amount of mix. Did you ever like, go out in the field and prove that that the case. I mean, my only experience with that, I think in Pendas, we, we were doing a reconstruction job when we were actually, uh, when the super first started, and we were worried about, you know, just putting six inches down to try to get compaction of those base layer, which. Right. And, th and that's exactly what I've been indoctrinated with. I mean, we all have. And I can tell you two things. The NCAT, NCAT did a study looking at that, and this is where the three to five came from. They stopped at five because they never looked beyond that. The other thing I'll say is Bill Pine, when he was with Illinois DOT, not that they did it as a routine practice, but quite there were a lot of times where they were paving eight times the nominal aggregate size, and they had no trouble getting density, whatever. Bill Pine's a pretty smart guy, and after he sat through our workshop, what he said to me was, I have an opportunity to share this, and in his opinion, the, the most important thing to getting density is having proper lift thickness. Um, and, and so I'm not, in, I'm not endorsing going eight times the nominal aggregate size, because the other thing that does pose issues okay, is if you start to go too thick, then maybe you have ride quality issues, you know, with the paver. Um, but my point is, is don't be afraid of this three to five and maybe going above that. I can tell you after we gave this talk, Eastern Federal Lands is going to do a project where they're going to place a 12.5 millimeter mix at three inches. Um, and they're going to invite us down and share all the data with us. Um, Region 2 has done uh, 6.3 at an inch and a half, which would be six times the nominal aggregate size. And um, Tim Romer loves it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg.